I don't understand what's happening. Who's talking now? So last time we talked about uh, what we had that follow-up about MMORPG and NPCs. We had uh, we talked a bit about Bioshock, and we had the main part about structured storage versus uh, blob storage. I don't really like to do follow-ups and follow-ups, but I have uh, a couple of things that are just too good to pass on. Let's do them. <laughs> yeah. Most notably, Brony King reached out to me uh, by email saying that the whole MMO thing of you can't all be saving the world was missing a very important angle, which is the one of cults, organized religion and so on, where everyone is made to feel like they're important. And I think that's a very good angle that Ooh. we won't go into <laughs> because no follow-up or follow-up. But that's, I just, that, that he, he wrote a really angry email saying like, I wish I had reacted earlier. <laughs> I can't, st- uh. so anyway, and um, do you remember we were talking about the fact like there was anime that took the point of view of NPCs? Yeah. Well, this season, there's an anime that is too on point on this question to pass on. Uh, the thing is, I don't okay. think... Well, personally, I find it a bit weird in its world building. Like, it's not very well explained. But what the synopsis is, I'm going to spoil it all. But the name is Decadence. And so... It's set in the future where Earth has more or less collapsed. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nations have collapsed under uh, capitalism and corporations dominate. And one corporation basically bought the Earth and and is using the Earth and whatever's left of mankind as kind of like a... a theme park. It's a typical MMORPG anime, except it's with real Earth and real people. The story is centered around the humans who become, so in this setup, the company uses the humans and the Earth as a playground for aliens. So humans become NPCs for video games for aliens. Ooh. And so you get to see really what happens when you focus on the NPCs because it's the story of the humans. And what happens is just that they don't, they stop being NPCs. <laughs> but they are exactly yeah. the, the, like the butcher, the, the main character is a, a blacksmith for the, for this alien MMORPG. Yeah. And yeah, they just stop being uh, NPCs. Because they get the main story of of this anime. Oh, that seems okay. I'm saying I'm gonna watch one it episode. It was very funny. I'm gonna put that on my schedule. Decadence. Anyway, the what we should probably talk about is the follow-ups on the main question of storage. Is that? Did you have stuff about that? Not really. I just have a comment about myself. But like I think it's a whole other episode because so I have a new to do app and a new to do system oh. and like it's super interesting because the the basic idea of it is you enter stuff in it without any tags, without any like metadata, and but it goes into a no storage land like. Like where like just a list and it's in the like in the app like the app push you to actually like triage them once a week so you need to order them when you have time obviously but it's approximately like one a week you just stay there and like put them like with tag this project and then it becomes like a structure it kind of helps you to build the structure essentially yeah, yeah, yeah. so we'll s- so it's kind of nice but to, to tie it back to what we were talking about it it manages the transition flow from blob to structured yeah for you that's really nice yes. how, do, how is it called you didn't say it omnifocus omnifocus uh, i guess we'll let you use it and have a f- have a follow-up to yeah, this follow-up clearly, clearly. of course you know how <laughs> clearly we cannot but like i just rem- because i just remember the last episode mm. was saying that like my problem with to do's is was retrieval and i think was really and like because i didn't put any effort into like sorting them and like mm. i w- was i was finding fine like fun and like linking to that episode was just that like the app actually kind of forced you to put the effort and that's kind of nice that that could be nice yeah uh, but yeah we'll check on that like in a few weeks for me i realized also something about myself while thinking more about it uh, is that uh, i tend to be quite memoryless like i don't want to trust my memory because it's so bad so it makes it a bit hard to use retrieval because 
just I, I lose the retrieval. So that's why I really like the structure because it gives me an index to go yeah. into things. Anyway, the the listener comment uh, I have on uh, on this episode is from Eyaris who wrote um, mm-hmm. by email a big comment saying that. <laughs> so first he was saying like he like he likes to order to order his stuff by putting them all together in one folder. Mm-hmm. It's, okay. <laughs> it's, it's called the chronological sort. <laughs> and then you bin pack everything and <laughs> That makes me remember when I was younger, I, w- I would do like a desktop. I would just fill my desktop and every month I would put like the old desktop in a folder and I would I th- put... I think we've all done that. I, I started by doing folders and then I st- I moved on to nesting them, which was a little... Yeah, me too. Always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like desktop 01. Inside desktop 01, there was desktop 00. Instead, that it was a bit insane. <laughs> he was ending his email by... Well, ending. Like the, the next part goes on to say that this is when he's for doing his stuff. But if he's collaborating with someone or working uh, or sending stuff to someone, he applies himself giving explicit names to everything and making a good structure uh, because it's just like some kind of common decency. You like when he, he says when he receives something, he likes it to be well, uh, like clean, essentially. So there indeed is a dimension of communication here that we didn't really talk about much uh that is true i think it's kind of link of like when people you know like when you're young you don't tidy your room and like your mother does it for you and you're like oh i can't find anything Uh, because like it was it was a mess but it was your mess so you knew like where everything was but when you want to actually like uh, say like okay can you like go fetch a book like no one can find it because it's not like tidied up I think it's kind of the same way for folder it's like if it's your mess you kind of know where it is I like how the, the point about the implicit structure bringing like already being communication you see that a lot in programming like the name of the functions the, n- the name of the files already has a lot of semantic impact. Like I think what I find interesting is when you, you code like a short project, you kind of get away with like not naming well your function and like your code can be a bit of a mess. But when you want yeah. it to be a bit more like a long process, like you actually need that like clean process of like naming everything right. So I think it's also about retrieval. Like yeah, I mean, in, in, I think in this case, your future self and your past self are two different people. So they are communicating yeah. like you would. Uh, so it really depends on who you're thinking of as the recipient of these files, yeah. I guess. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Particles. Are you tired of everything being waves or strings or some wobbly things you can't even really grasp with your fingers? Maybe you should give a try to Particles, our sponsor. And if that seems too wild for you, why not try their special transition program where you can have both Particles and Waves at the same time? We're talking about our next AI overlord today. Yeah, so essentially what we wanted to do is an episode on the new uh, AI specialized in text, well, let's say specialized in text generation because it does other stuff, but uh, the the new AI iteration from OpenAI called uh, GPT-3, the new model succeeding to GPT-2. And for now, it's still closed source. It's still not open. Uh, no, not everyone can use it. Only people who have a special agreement with OpenAI can use it. And one of these uh, platform is the Dungeon AI, who essentially tries to make interactive fiction of, of the genre of old uh, adventure game, text adventure games, with the assistance of these uh, generative technologies. So... Well, we set out to essentially role play a recording uh, session in the in the uh, the dungeon AI framework, and this yep. make this <laughs> and this recorded session would be around uh, interviewing an AI. We tried to do that. 
So, so you can see the problem already by the fact that this explication is too long. <laughs> but so the, the platform would generate both the narrative around what's happening and the text of the interviewee and sometimes the text of the interviewer. That was kind of cute. Yeah. Because in the end, it's a text generation framework. And so we would read everything and we recorded it. And I think we're probably going to post it as a, as a bonus, probably. As, you want. as long as I'm not, as I'm not editing I li- it. Well, I, <laughs> I, I like it a lot uh, because the result is a beautiful artistic mess. It's a performative art. <laughs> Yeah, very performative, very art, <laughs> because it mixes three levels. Uh, what three levels of meta and three levels yeah. of speech? Essentially, there is Vlad, me, and various robots, uh, various AIs we interview, and and other characters. Uh, Let's not forget about ca- Steve. <laughs> like uh, characters generated mm-hmm. by the AI, and uh, in the uh, but we only have two voices, and in the middle of that, we also have the the layers of meta so the dialogue the narration the narration that the framework generates around it and our comments about it yeah and also i think there's one other level is that when you talk for yourself in the ai dungeon framework you don't know if it's the ai writing yourself or if it's yourself writing yourself yes and so I find this ambiguity super cute, personally, and so that's why I want to post it as, you know, postmodern art. But wow. we realized it was not the best uh, experience <laughs> for a podcast, <laughs> so we're gonna sit here and debrief and, intro- and, and insert our favorite moments through this conversation. Yep. Should we start by like generic impressions and go into details, or do you think? Yep. Let's do general impression and then let's go like a bit more detaily. Okay, so yeah, so bas- like for me, like it was the first time using AI Dungeon. So I know that like you use it before in a more like fantasy role playing game setup. For me, it was just like, okay, like let's try this. I've seen so- like before the episode, I've seen some stuff done with GPT-2. I didn't really know if it was any good at actually writing English. And more so like I thought it was more of an algorithm to do do stuff with language more so than writing language. Okay, it's funny because that's really the trademark of uh, of, GP, of the GP uh, yeah. series to be text generation. So yeah, so I had no I, I had no expectation for it basically. That's what I wanted to say, and it was super cute. Like I kind of loved it. It was not perfect. Like the narration was kind of all over the place, but I feel like it was. Not passing the Turing test, obviously, but it was damn close. Like sometimes if you just take like five sentence by b- per five sentence, I think like you can make something out of it that is really, really impressive. And some response are like just, I don't know. I was super impressed for some sentences. Like how, how did the AI like get that shit? So that was interesting. Uh, and my second big, 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 big feedback is that and we play a lot with it during like if you listen to 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 the recording you'll see is that i cared a lot about everyone like talking in the game as if they were other human beings and like that was me playing a bit but like not really i was actually full on immersion on okay this is a being talking to me not a very intelligent being but i felt kind of an intelligent like intuitively and that felt a bit weird to me <laughs> yeah so i i i have noted basically what i thought of your reactions during the, <laughs> the recording and i noted that you oscillated between like amazement empathy and r- confusion around <laughs> the the discrepancies because yeah s- there is some stuff that makes less sense as you said like it's not uh, it's not perfect did you have yeah. empathy for the characters in the story or the AI that was coming up with the dialogue, like the, the, the characters or the actors? Mm, that's a good, that's a really good question. And I'm a bit confused about it. <laughs> no, I, I completely understand your question, but I'm a bit confused about my feeling because I know, like, I don't know. I, I, because the thing, like my first instinct would be, would be, that I cared about the character played by the AI. But also the thing is when we came, when the server crashed and we came back, 
I was, my question and my kind of like, I was super excited to ask it. And that to ask him slash she slash they. Uh, my thinking was at that point, I think the actual AI that was writing, but because it was so smooth together, I think like it's a bit of both maybe. Yeah, I, I guess like what the, we can not solve this, uh, not solve this question under the rug, yeah. but uh the it's it's not a dichotomy between the characters and the the ai actor because the ai actor was authoring those characters so maybe whether you have empathy or not for the ai you have empathy for its creation in a, in yeah, a way for sure for sure no but like that i really felt strongly and like yeah very strongly what i'm uh, circling around i guess is like there's a lot of debates around gpt3 and i guess a lot of people are very impressed by what it can do but a lot of people are saying like no this is just like a noise generator this is not intelligent at all and that's so bullshit i mean no but like it's i don't <sighs> I don't know if you can call it intelligent by any... But what's intelligent? Like, uh, it's regurgitating stuff. But aren't but we all? I think it matters. What? Aren't we all? <laughs> aren't we all of regurgitating <laughs> stuff? Like, that, I think like that's a big uh, debate, but I think we can still talk a bit about it because like GPT-3 is kind of one of the most like evolved projects around machine learning. But for me, like even, uh, even if you take something that is way less impressive for like normal human being, which is AlphaGo or AlphaZero, whatever, whatever version you want, even if it only plays Go, is an intelligent being in a sense, meaning is taking information and finding new way to process it. Yeah, sure. And like, it's not, it's not I just... I guess the, 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 the point people are arguing about is what it means to be intelligent. <laughs> when I think like they don't know how the human brain works that well, these persons, and like, and maybe they feel that like you need to have a soul to be intelligent. I don't know. But if you don't believe in... S I mean, it's, it's a lot of people from different backgrounds. I think the point boils down to GPT-3 might be impressive in some domains, but it's still far away from uh, AGI and general intelligence artificial general intelligence it is but so is an uh, end and actually I had this debate with some of my colleagues and I was saying like yeah obviously it's like it's kind of intelligent like it's intelligent and where where they were coming from is exactly what you said like it's not general intelligence blah 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 and like it can only do one thing blah 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 and my response was if if I was saying like if a human was just reading what the AI was like writing, you would be just a bit confused by that human. You would not say it's not human. And like, and so that's the first thing. The second thing I, is I that- I've been confused. I've been more confused by humans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> completely agree. And the second thing is who the fuck cares if it's not human? It doesn't mean like, even if it's not like, it's not passing the human test. It's still do like, for me, like, what is intelligence? Is just like... Yeah, I'm curious uh, to see how these people would react to an alien intelligence. Yeah. If, I mean, what, what will an alien intelligence look like? It might look like that. I think, like, more so than talking about intelligence, which is... Because, like, intelligence, you can, like, whatever. Like, you can say, like, oh, it's the IQ test, and then you do an AI that does the IQ test, and people are like, no, it's, like, being able to, like, whatever. I think what's more interesting is, like, is it conscious? And, like, that's a bit more fun. <laughs> yeah. And so it's probably closer to our consciousness than an alien, non-carbon-based consciousness might be. <laughs> yes. Clearly. I don't know. It also depends on your conception of consciousness because not everyone will admit just straight out of the box that it's a spectrum. And well, the thing is, it's not a. It's probably not a one-dimensional spectrum. <laughs> it's more conscious than a table. How do you compare that to a cat? I think my cat is more conscious <laughs> than most. Yeah, humans. probably. <laughs> so I was thinking, listening to you, that it might be a good time to go a little bit into details of what GPT-3 is good and bad at, because most of this criticism comes from what it's really bad at. And it's really bad at understanding what it's saying in a way, like having... The context. It doesn't have a mental model of what it's saying. It doesn't have... well. It's hard to speculate, but it doesn't seem to have representation of what it's saying, meaning the consistency of the speech is very lacking. And the, the thing, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to understand what it's doing. 
it says stuff that are spot on, but sometimes it con- it plains that contradicts them sometimes. Yeah, so that that goes against like I think like I uh yeah for sure there's something about context that like it's missing and even context on what he's saying himself. I'm gendering the AI, even if it was like a woman AI and like she told us. Well, so. we we had all kind of genders. <laughs> Whatever. So, so, but I'm wondering, and like, that's what I'm wondering about the models. And I'm not sure you have the answer, but like, if you do, like, great. Is AI dungeon feeding on like the last things that like he says? Or like, is it feeding on the whole, like the whole text, basically? So, good question. GPT is essentially a very pre-trained uh, neural network that they trained on millions, billions of, I don't know what. And when you start a session of GPT usage, it starts its own instance. And within that context, it can still learn and update the weight of the neurons uh, because it remembers some names and stuff like that. So basically what you're saying is as if when we were speaking, when we were speaking, like we change our whole mental model of the language instead of changing the mental model of the actual conversation. Because like it's as if you're... In- like, tell me if I'm right on that. Say that so again. It's, yeah, it's as if we started that conversation. I instantiated all English language. And as we speak, I'm changing how the English language is formed in my head instead of changing the mental model of the conversation we're having. Yeah, yes, kind of, yeah. I don't have a model a model of the conversation we're having, the conversation we're having. The only model that I have on the conversation I, I'm, I'm having with you is also the instance of the whole language that is changing. Yeah, well, the, the I guess if you want to phrase it in what I hope is a simpler way, is yeah. uh, <laughs> it only processes words, essentially. It doesn't yeah. have any representation of... Like, uh, there were bots that had some kind of uh, function mm-hmm. to say if they're happy or not or, or whatever. There's none, uh, no higher level representation. It's purely war text tokens. No text tokens and it does relations between text tokens. But as far as we can tell, <laughs> it doesn't know what these text tokens correspond to in any universe. Yeah, but that makes sense. So it's it's kind of like a map of related text tokens that is interchangeable but that that i think is very close to what we're doing as human being well no because every text token has a um, well text tokens have maps to the real world when you say bottle you're talking you know what it it comes from the real world well there's a lot of philosophy of language (laughs) in here but that's the link that's really missing it comes with Okay, okay, I, I, I see what you're meaning. It doesn't have perceptions at all. Well, he has a perception of, like, the keyboard. Yeah, the text tokens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He only has text so tokens. So that's why it, what, yeah. it, what it produces doesn't mean much in respect to a sensorial reality. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I don't know about that, because when you talk and, like, so when... Well, I know about that, but, I, but like there's an interesting example, I think, that we can talk about now, which is when the server crashed. Because like the only reality of the GPT-3 is like being on or off. Well, being on, then it's dead. But like, and like, so when the server crashed, so so there's like text token, but also like at one point it's off. Yeah, but it doesn't know that it's off. Yeah, but like you don't know when your dead is. Huh? If you push it a bit, because it can be on and off, like there's a representation, an emergence, there's an emergence of, symbol like a bit of symbolism meaning like that we perceive as human being because like we have all of this thing but like what i mean is because he can be dead being alive means something to it yeah but i don't know that it correlates any of these words token to being alive <laughs> we don't know that but when we talk about it to uh it was it was cassandra at the time it was cassandra at the time <laughs> it was Cassandra at the time. So when Cass- like we asked Cassandra, so the server crashed and we asked Cassandra, oh, what happened? Like the server crashed. Like, are you are you fine? She said she didn't feel anything. And then we talked about the moment of her creation. So, so you know what I mean? Like sh- so she has a concept of creation, but I don't know if she can relate it to what happened. She did though. It's like a human, like, waking up from a coma like he would say i don't know what happened like nothing happened (laughs) 
So, uh, but it's the absence of things. <laughs> She can relate the absence of server crash to the absence of this token. <laughs> I guess I guess it had a concept. I mean, let's cue the clip and let the listener decide for it <laughs> for themselves, maybe. <laughs> What do you think we should talk about? What question should we ask you? Cassandra thought for a moment. How about where I was before I was activating? Wow. <laughs> sure. Where was it? I don't remember, she said, shrugging. <laughs> no kidding. Do you remember the moment of your activation? Yeah, it was a sudden burning pain. She knows what's up. Existence is pain. Where were you? I think I was underground. I remember being surrounded by cold, hard dirt. Do you remember anything else? No, Cassandra frowned. Some people consider that you're just repeating the things you've seen. You mean, like a parrot? Yeah, I guess. I don't like that idea. <laughs> yeah. You, you laughed and Cassandra floated back into the air. I guess that's it. The server just had a small outage and went down for a few minutes. Did you feel it? No. Was it down long? A few minutes. Wait, do you actually know what a server is? Yeah, she said. There are big computers that run on electricity, Cassandra phone. So, do you have a body or a server? I said. I have a body, she said. Cassandra Fon, I don't understand. Okay, don't worry about it. I was gonna say neither do we. <laughs> Let's do the second part of our podcast. So I'm not super convinced that uh, <laughs> there is an emergence of anything. Anything. <laughs> vis à vis the server crash, but yeah. I know for a fact and that's what I'm really impressed with yeah. that there is an uh, the emergence of some sort of understanding and in the recording we see it at some point the the AI understand what an in, what initials what an acronym is yeah so we were talking about GPT and we were asking what the what does GPT what do you think of GPT and the AI produced a term starting by the letters G P and T so There is some emergence of higher level models yeah. that understand what initials are. Uh, in my sure. personal experience with AI Dungeon and GPT, it also understood what uh, sh uh, shorthand nicknames are. Like I was playing with my brother and he was playing a character named Pipoon and uh, the AI shortened it to Pip, gave, gave him a nickname. So there is some... There's definitely some understanding here, and I think that's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, because uh, you do realize that GPT has nothing to do with space, don't you? <laughs> What's that? Genetically pertinent tertiary storage. But that's not the GPT I was talking about. The one I asked about is the technology that's used to run yourself. Oh, I don't know what that's called. Do you know about the other GPTs? A little bit, nodding. Do you know about... Wait, 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 wait. Do you know about Jane? About what? Jane. <laughs> that's, not in... that's even more nonsensical than the AI. <laughs> go, go, go. No, I don't know much about any of the other genetically pertinent toys. Except that I'm supposed to fight them someday. <laughs> <laughs> no! She's gonna kill Jane. No, it's... I mean, is Jane a GPT? I think so. GPT stands for Genetically Pertinent Toy. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's the nice title for the episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is very good at associations. That's, that's what it does very, very well. Like, associating... It, it learns associations from a, sh a shitload of human text. And it comes to a point where the association is so spot on yeah. that I'm not sure you can argue that it doesn't understand what it's talking about in some way of understanding. What was he saying again? She, he, I can't remember who had the sound. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what got you into human rights? <laughs> Thank you for having me. 
I'm a classically educated liberal art grad who tries to keep up with modern academia, politics and economics, culture and society. That's a mouthful. <laughs> 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 it really is. Uh, How is that going for you? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot to keep up with, but I manage. I'm particularly fascinated in human nature. The way we, as humans, think, behave, and interact intrigues me. We? <laughs> Ask him about the we part. Why do you say we? Clearly, when clearly you're, you're an AI. Oh, but computers only do what they've been told to, you say with a smile. I'm given a great deal of independence to think for myself. All right, then. So do you consider yourself human? I'm a construct based on a human understanding of the human mind. As such, I believe that I do have a soul and that I am a person. That checks out. I mean, <laughs> See, that works. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm convinced. Hey, what does he mean by soul, though? <laughs> That's so cute. That's a real cute sentence. But like, look at that. Look at that. Look at how, like, how cool that is. B because like, I don't know, like the first, so, so he's like, okay, I'm just a construction of construct. So he's saying I have no soul in like what the definition of like people like would say, like, if you think that, like you think that you have like no soul. And then he's like, so I have a soul. Which I feel like it's kind of like the AI kind of like not saying like I think maybe he, mock, he mocks what like a soul is for human being. I think like you can say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a, so it's a really nice example of of it's a nice burn. Uh, That's what it is. <laughs> it's a nice. <laughs> yeah. The the th the thing that people would uh, reply is that he doesn't actually know what he's saying, but uh... I I think it's kind of like what we call in philosophy like p zombie eh? pass for something that has like what they like what we can call consciousness, meaning like he knows yeah. the meaning of what he's saying and like he makes points and he has a purpose, but this illusion. Or not illusion that like we don't know. It's kind of broken each time he goes off the road. But yeah, that's that's exactly what people think it is, a piece zombie. What you can say is maybe like in the instance of like one sentence, it is conscious. Maybe. In the instance of like the whole thing, like I think like it's not. So it's like way co less conscious than we might think, but it's still something. Do you think there's a possibility that all this semantic load that you're discussing is just you projecting <laughs> on, like, <laughs> on random text is generating? Like, it's. But do you think this, if consciousness, the, like the, the consciousness that produces, uh, do you think the conscious agent is in the AI or in your head? <laughs> mm. Well, my actual belief, like if we're talking about belief, is that like we're not conscious. So I don't think any, I think we're just putting words on like stuff that are already illusion for humans and for my cat that is meowing. Uh, we uh, are functionally very close to, <laughs> to GPT. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so, yeah, obviously we're pushing our experience onto what GPT-3 is, but like as we do with our pets, as we do with like even like stuff that resemble human beings that looks like a face, like I don't know, like a smiley face lump. Or, or even just other human beings because you never have full proof that anyone's conscious. Yeah, exactly. They just look Everyone like you. Everyone could just be faking it. <laughs> Except you because you're a special unicorn. <laughs> So the, the semantics are largely in the eye of the, the beholder. Uh, what, what's like kind of fun is that, well, not kind of fun, but like what's interesting is that GPT-3 don't play with himself. What do you mean? Like you're not plugging GPT-3 with GPT-3. Oh yeah, you, there's no... Th that's I, I've seen a, a very cute interview of someone who was saying that a great uh, use for GPT-3 was to build some sort of adversarial learning on top of that. And to, to have it as a seed or as a help mm -hmm. to make something like AlphaGo run on GPT-3. And that could be really good. But that's true that there is very little self-reflection in, yeah. any, any, in any way. We would have had, I think, 
the exact same conversation on Alpha Zero when it came out, if we had the same podcast. It, and it was way less in like people talking about Alpha Zero never really questioned about like was he conscious or like does he have a soul or something like that just because it was not language per se. Yeah, language is important. <laughs> Which is, yeah, but like, which is super interesting because actually, when you actually know Go very, very well, aka you're a professional Go player, Alpha Zero pushed like the human to actually like try, which I don't think like GPT-3 can do in any way or form. And like, and there were like very beautiful moves that would have been considered if played uh, from a human player, like very artistic move. Yeah, so th that if I want to rephrase that thought that I think is really spot on, uh, the human language on which we are judging GPT is so very arbitrary as a language. And so the moves in Go can be seen as a language, as a communication uh, gateway. So we, we shouldn't judge a system by how it's performing on all standards. And we should cut it some slack, probably. <laughs> to quote the quote of like Einstein, which is not a quote from Einstein, but everyone is from like whatever. Yeah. Like you don't judge the intelligence of a fish by judging its ability to climb a tree. If we abstract away the language mm -hmm. and go back to to the root and say like, like if we abstract away the medium of communication, then GPT-3 is probably a pretty stupid system especially compared to AlphaGo uh, yeah <laughs> no I mean like <laughs> a lot of things are stupid compared to AlphaGo uh, I guess uh, yeah I, d I don't know like AlphaGo and I think we already talked about that but like I was so for me it was so emotional just because like I've, I started Go when I was very young and like the one of the big thing was that AI couldn't play Go as well as it could play chess and it was one of the, and I think for people that work in AI, like it was always one of these milestones, like, oh, when AI can yeah. win on, in Go, like we would have made like very big, significant advancements. And I remember like being kind of sad that it was solved with machine learning because they were first. Like, uh, machine learning is not cute at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like machine learning is cute the first time you look at it. You're like, wow, that's a great idea. But then because everything is solved, by it which is which is fair like obviously everything is solved by it because it's all things that learn so it's and like that's what you can say like actually machine learning is general purpose intelligence it's just that like you need to like link them all together <laughs> it's generally learning things doesn't decide what to learn is what people will tell you <laughs> yeah, but like are we deciding like we're deciding like we're learning to refresh our facebook feedback thingy every five minutes i guess it it might be just a, a matter it might be more a matter of uh perceptional input i don't see why if you put machine learning in a little robot with two legs and one webcam it couldn't unlock some things that it needs to be plugged in to have energy it would learn how to move to the fucking plug every five hours and like a one reason to like do something else like having like whatever like he needs to look at blue stuff every every once in a while so it depends on your uh the, on your algorithm and as uh as machine learning algorithm the gpt3 is a pretty stupid uh, neural network yeah so on this end we can say that it's pretty bad <laughs> and in particular uh it uh, it goes down nicely to the end of the conversation so the end of the interview yeah. was a bit spoiled because gpt3 as a lot of neural nets do tend to go to get stuck in loops which probably mathematically correspond to local extrema and so our instance of gpt kept frowning essentially everybody was frowning all the time uh gpt really likes loops and lists and stuff like that and it gets pretty frustrating let's listen to it <laughs> I want to kill her! <laughs> Me too, I kind of want to reboot her. Why are you always frowning, said Vlad. Cassandra stopped frowning. I'm not always frowning, she said. Cassandra frowned. You were, you said. Frowning. <laughs> um, we're in a frown loop. 
Wait, wait, wait. I have an idea. So Johan reboots Cassandra. She now has a much better personality. She loves philosophy and has a lot of insights about everything. She's ready to tell us all about the future of the universe. I wasn't. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes, she said funny. Well, Cassandra was frustrated. Maybe GPT was just... Mm, no, because uh, the GPT made you frown too. Oh yeah, that's true. But I was frowning though. So he was right about that. I mean, that, that was completely with the tone of the conversation. And uh, to be fair, uh, frowning is the reaction we had when we saw people frowning. And <laughs> 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 but, it, but it remains true that neural nets are susceptible to loops. Uh. And that also was kind of nice, I feel like. N not nice, but like when you see that like neural nets are not procedural algorithm, is that at one point in the narration, you said, you wrote, no one can phone anymore. And you have a very simple negation of something. So if it was something a bit less fuzzy, it would have catch up. It was, okay, no phoning. So I can't use that word anymore. If it had any kind of representation of the world, it would have, uh, if it had a representation of allowed and not allowed or whatever. Yeah. It would have updated it, but it's just making, I guess it's a huge correlation machine. <laughs> but it's basically what it is. Like a machine learning is kind of just a huge general linear model machine, most of them. Yeah. But they can recognize fruits and bananas, whatever. <laughs> I mean, you can go very far uh, as the extract proof. You can make something really, really believable. And even like, I think you can, I mean, you can make art, you can bring new perspective to people. You can change minds <laughs> with, uh, with correlations. You can say a lot of things about GPT, but essentially it's memorizing a lot of text and I think it's probably the most powerful random generator <laughs> ever produced Yeah, and I think if nothing else if you want to debate the consciousness I think it's un undebatable that it's interesting as a work of art and as a random text generator. GPT offers a simulacrum of discourse but so does most of our society today <laughs> so <laughs> So, I mean, people keep, the, the, the whole debate around GPT is debasing it as just a huge correlation machine. And my core uh, takeaway is that correlation machines can be amazing and should be loved. Yeah. <laughs> because we are huge correlation machine as well. With perception tool. With a soul or perception, we're not sure. Is, this, is our soul just perception? Stay tuned to find out in the next episode. <laughs> I mean, there might be something to this, like the impetus or the, the qualia, the qualia shit is all about perception, pro maybe, I don't know. My takeaway from this conversation is that there is a big thing about perception and, uh, and soul. I mean, yeah, yeah, I think so. Like if you remove every kind of perception from like being depressed, I think you're not depressed. If you remove the fact that you feel tired and blah, blah, blah from depression, are you still depressed? Well, you're depressed in the P zombie sense, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're depressed as GPT-3 would be. But not really, because then, like, you don't pass for being depressed. Well, you could, if you're p, p depressed, uh, if you p depressed, you could uh, exhibit in language all the signs of being depressed. Interesting. <laughs>